you just want to start off, just share about your visit with the Korean journalists. Like, what? How was that experience for you? <laughs> I I really enjoyed it. You know, it's it's very rare that we have an opportunity to engage with you know, journalists from another country, especially one with as close ties to Hawaii as South Korea. Um, it's always a little bit of an adjustment because we have translators involved. So we have to stop and pause and, and be able to respond. But they had very engaging questions. I think they were genuinely interested in um, my perspectives. Um, and I do think as well, being in the United States Capitol, they were kind of at the center of it all. So I think there was a lot for them to take in and digest. And so, you know, it was a very positive experience. I, I'm, I'm grateful that they considered me and came and met with me. I, I will say that was, you know, interesting for me too. When we were in Korea meeting with, you know, government officials right. there is talking through a translator. Uh, I will say, I think everyone there, of course, spoke better English <laughs> than we spoke Korean. Korean, um, right. <laughs> but even when we got to meet with the Korean journalists in DC, we spoke a lot through a translator because just so much can right. get lost in translation. Exactly. And so I, that is definitely interesting, you know, being able to work with that and try to have as deep of conversations as you possibly can have. Right, right. Absolutely. You know, and, and to your point, especially when we're dealing with potentially diplomatic relations, when we think about at the end of the day, uh, language matters. Uh, lost in translation can be a really bad thing if you think about it. And so I do think for many of us, we are having to be very meaningful in our responses to, to the questions that they posed. Um, at the same time, it was helpful to know that you could tell even as I was talking to the translator and to them, they already did understand a bit of what I was saying, right? Their grasp of English really helped to already bridge a part of that that gap. I felt, if anything, like I just, I didn't know enough of the words that they were saying to be able to really contribute as much as I would have liked to. And so, um, <laughs> you know, coming home and telling my kids, we really need to make sure that you are bilingual in some way, because that is going to make a difference for whatever you do you yes. know, growing up. Yes. I, do you remember any of the specific questions that they asked you? I mean, uh, the topic of the trip overall for the U.S. journalists to Korea mm -hmm. and the Korean journalists to the U.S. was the relationship between our yeah. two countries in an election year. So right. I'm, I'm guessing they probably picked your brain a lot in regards to that? There are definitely collect, um, questions about the election. They had questions about the presidential election, obviously very top of mind, even when they sat with me, more so now probably if they were to sit in a room with me. Um, they had questions about the House majority and the Senate. So all of the, you know, the impacts of the elections on relationships, what I even thought would happen. Um, and there were, yes, it, it was a conversation often about us south korea relationships right and, and our, our dialogue but of course you can't you know discount the 800 pound gorilla in the room as well right which is north korea and so north korea uh did come up quite often discussions about denuclearization and threats and whatnot so that was definitely um, very top of mind for them as well as you know my conversations with the journalists and then also with business leaders, community leaders, mm -hmm. government officials while I was in Korea was, of course, talking about those relationships. And I will say like mm -hmm. a common theme seemed to be South Koreans were a little critical of the U.S. South Korean relations at this point in time. And a lot of that revolved around North Korea. So yeah. I just wanted to, you know, get your thoughts on that like how do you think u.s korean relations are right now you know i think that's why it, it's really important that we do exchanges like this because i think we can think um we're doing more than enough that we're doing significant outreach and honestly the biden administration has made significant outreaches and engagement bringing you know literally uh the president of south korea to you know camp david you're looking at the trilateral conversations, you know, that we've been having South Korea and Japan, bringing them together, being a, what is a historic bridge between two countries that, yes, have very common interests right now in the Indo-Pacific, but historically um, have, have been at war. 
right? To be very, very frank about it, the ability for the United States to be that bridge, that partner, that common friend and ally is significant. So while we may feel like, you know, we have definitely been increasing the outreach and engagement with South Korea. It, it is interesting, and I think it's important that we know what is the perspective on the South Korean side. And I do think part of perhaps that feeling from South Korea that we aren't doing enough is the reality that they are living right next door, literally next door, across a single line, you know, to a real threat. And you cannot discount what that does in terms of that feeling of urgency or that desire for even more action and engagement from partners and allies like the United States. And so while, while I do feel that we have been increasingly engaged with South Korea and doing quite a bit, I also can understand why for them, um, every morning that they wake up, this is a threat that exists, um, you know, and they want to see um, that they have a friend in the United States that's going to have their back, quite frankly. And um, I think it's incumbent on us to make sure that we let them know. And that was something I communicated to the journalists that were there, that you do have allies and friends, even within Congress and myself and so many others that truly um, recognize the importance of South Korea, um, not just in the Indo-Pacific, but even globally. They are a partner, friend and ally, um, and the United States is right there with them. Um. The trilateral, of course, was a big conversation that we had, and it was it definitely viewed as a positive thing through most of our conversations. And as That's you great. mentioned, it the big thing was North Korea. That was kind of where uh, people were voicing their concerns um, wow. and, you know, looking at where the relationship maybe wasn't the strongest right now. And of course, as you mentioned, like it's a line separating. And so yeah. they security is always that thing that mm -hmm. they're thinking about. And something I thought was really interesting um, in one of our conversations, they described South Korea as an island, which, you know, you don't think about because they're mm. connected, but that's how they look at it because they're oh. separated, you know, yeah. through by North Korea to mainland China, uh, and they have no contact really. So mm -hmm. they are kind of like an island mm -hmm. on that peninsula, um, yeah. which, you know, especially coming from here, you know, you definitely look at things differently as an yeah. island versus mm -hmm. if you're part of the contingent United States. Yeah. No, I mean, I think. You know, and again, I think that is why, especially coming from Hawaii, we've always recognized the importance of um, reaching out, engaging with fellow island communities, island states, if you will. Island culture is, in fact, different. In so many ways, we have to know that we are going to have to depend on ourselves. Um, and that is one of the things, because being an island can be very isolating. Um, there's a lot of great things about being on an island, right? We know that. We, we know that it's probably the best way to live. At the same time, you do think a little bit more seriously about things like security. You think about your defenses around your entire perimeter. Um, you're very hyper aware of things like that, that perhaps on the continent, you aren't. That there are no threats if you're in the middle um, or if you're such a large mass at this particular point that, you know, you don't have to worry from all sides. But I do think that there is something about island culture that Hawaii can relate to so much more than anyone else. Um, no, any other state in the United States, perhaps Alaska would be the, the closest other ones that could understand it. But again, our proximity to the Pacific, um, we can understand why when we talk about relationships being important, deterrence mattering, um, not spurring aggression. Uh, it's because at all times, if we think about Hawaii or South Korea, we are constantly thinking about a 360 degree view of our perimeter and protecting our borders and our people, um, you know, and that is part of being an island state. Yeah. Um, you know, a big conversation also in terms of security was, of course, having nuclear weapons mm -hmm. uh, as we're talking about North Korea, of course. Right. Uh, one thing that came up a few times once people knew I was from Hawaii was the <laughs> false missile threat yeah. we had a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as that is something I think us here think about a little more in terms of North Korea than maybe some other parts in the United States. It's definitely mm -hmm. something South Korea thinks about 
all the time. All the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I know a big conversation for them right now is them having their own nuclear weapons. Is, mm-hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? Because I know the U.S. has not really been in support of them wanting to have their own nuclear weapons. Yeah. Yeah. I will say first to start off that even in my conversation with um, the South Korean journalists, the false missile alert came up. Um, I brought it up, actually, and I often actually bring it up in Congress as well, in different spaces and different conversations. But I do think Hawaii is unfortunately unique in the sense that not many people can say that they know what it's like to live through a minute or two minutes or potentially even more, depending where you were in the state, thinking this was it. Um, Having your phone blow up with this alert, um, your television all of a sudden completely blacking out with this warning sirens. I remember that morning, you know, it was, you know, there was soccer going on behind my house. I have a field opening the curtains and just seeing panic, people leaving everything in place, coolers, tents in place, chairs, picking up children bodily and running. I mean, it was like something out of a a horror movie, right? That so many of us internalize and we remember. And I said, very few people can think, remember, or have experienced that moment right now. And so when we talk about deterrence at the end of the day, when we talk about, yes, having the defenses to be able to defend and deter aggression, but the reality potentially even for a few minutes of thinking this is what war looks like when you engage with either nuclear or missile technology um, it is a very humbling discussion it's it's not one that i take lightly at all and so when we talk about um, the armaments of the neighboring country of south korea i think that is a very complicated metrics i don't know you have to ask yourself does that deter or does that agitate and that's a really find although somewhat definitive line when you're dealing with a dictatorship an unstable dictatorship like North Korea you have to ask yourself if we put bombs that close right will that help defend and keep you safer or will that actually poke the bear will that actually and even being in proximity to China right you are surrounded in so many ways will that actually make you safer or will it actually create greater risk and threat um, and I think, you know, many of us w- could argue that it would actually increase the risk and the threat. Um, how we deter aggression is strong relationships at the end of the day. It's North Korea and China knowing that the United States, South Korea, Japan, the Philippines, Australia, so many others, we have sat down at common tables and we know that when push comes to shove, we will have each other's back. That is to me true deterrence without having to arm ourselves up to the point where we are actually asking for aggression and for war. Thank you for your thoughts, Rep. I appreciate that. And you mentioned it a couple of times, just, you know, the Indo-Pacific and Korea's role there. And of course, Hawaii comes up a lot when you're talking about the Indo-Pacific. Is how do you view Hawaii in terms of issues in the Indo-Pacific? Do you think us here need to be more focused on those types of things than let's say other places in the United States. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I serve on the Armed Services Committee and every region of the world is important when it comes to our collective defense, when it comes to supporting our allies, being hyper aware of our adversaries and their actions. But um, clearly the Indo-Pacific is the one that to me is very much personal and critically important as well. And so much of what happens even around the globe impacts the Indo-Pacific, right? What gives China um, encouragement, you know, um, or, or insight into how we would respond to aggression in the Indo-Pacific? We are, I'm, it always comes back, for me at least, to the Indo-Pacific. And I often tell folks that Hawaii is on the front doorstep. We are right, we are as close as you can get. So geopolitically, we are so critical in terms of being a strategic defense point for the United States and our allies. You know, I do feel that it's important in Hawaii that we recognize the role that we play 
Um, there's often controversy surrounding the military in Hawaii, and there is definitely room for discussion on balance and all these other types of things, but you cannot negate just where we physically sit in the world and how that plays an important role on what happens or what doesn't happen in the Indo-Pacific. And so I do think that um, it should be something we're constantly having conversations about that we are being reported on, you know, and we're talking about what is our role? How are we contributing to a positive and peaceful Indo-Pacific? That's everyone's goal at the end of, at the, end of the day, a peaceful Indo-Pacific, um, free of aggression and threat. Um, I will add this, and so I think it was something that I brought up to the journalists as well, but I think historically Hawaii's been looked at as a place potentially where peace is possible. So when we think about the fact that you have the East-West Center right here in Hawaii, you have the Asia Pacific Center for Strategic Studies. That's a mouthful. It's an acronym. Um, but Senator Inoy helped to establish that center, you know, and our congressional delegation has supported East-West Center from the very, very beginning. To me, these are institutions of peace where individuals from countries that don't get along necessarily can sit together in common tables and common rooms and learn about each other in some contexts or have discussions, safe conversations and others. Um, these two institutions are very different. But again, to me, the fact that they are situated right here in Hawaii, um, it, it really underscores the important role we play in giving hope for that peaceful, peaceful um, Indo-Pacific at the end of the day. We've gotta be the place where people can gather, learn about each other, have conversations, develop relationships, that's going to be our best chance at diplomacy. That's our best defense to me against aggression in the Indo-Pacific, um, gives us our best chance for peace. Do you, I know you in your position, you definitely have a voice at the table. Do you think that Hawaii has a big enough, you know, voice when it comes to these conversations in Washington, D.C.? I will always feel that we have to have a bigger, bigger voice. <laughs> I think we just have to speak extremely loudly and we have to make sure that we are at every table that we should be. Um, I think that's always been uh, the situation, right? We have to put ourselves um, at the right tables to be making sure that they recognize the unique pers perspectives uh, that we have being from Hawaii. Again, a lot of people can say that it's personal for them. It truly is personal for us in Hawaii. We are talking about the safety and security of our constituents, our families. When we fly 5,000 miles to Washington, D.C., I'm leaving my husband and my two kids, my entire family, my ohana, here in Hawaii. So when we talk about what happens in a threat experience, remembering the false missile alert, not knowing where my husband was because he was over the mountain, at that particular time and my two children are with me. Every moment I'm in DC, I think about, are they safe? On a number of different fronts, but especially when I sit in those armed services committee hearings and we're talking about the Indo-Pacific, the first thing that flashes into my mind is our families, our homes. This is not some strategic exercise for us in Hawaii. This is real life. We have experienced it multiple times, even in our history. I remind people, Japan did not pick us at the start of World War II because they, they, you know, randomly picked an island on a map. We are strategic. We know this historically. And so for us, it is very personal and we have to ensure and put ourselves at the right tables in the right rooms to make sure that as we invest, as we make strategic decisions, Hawaii is represented. Um, I've often pushed even more so that when it comes to developing, you know, the skilled workforce needed to make decisions about the Indo-Pacific, that Hawaii, people from Hawaii in particular, are uniquely positioned given just our cultural competencies, the strategic empathy that we have. We live and breathe the Indo-Pacific from the moment we are born here. I honestly think that's gonna give us the best shot at truly understanding both ally and adversary and helping us to determine what the path forward is. And so when I go into briefings on the Indo-Pacific, my goal is that we see more of our kids, our kama'aina, sitting in that room talking about what they think will work, what will not work, helping to plan the defense of our country through the Indo-Pacific. Right now, I don't see as many faces, if any, 
that I would like, that have to me that innate competencies um, from living and being a part of the Indo-Pacific, you know? And, and so for me, that, that is a goal. That's a goal. So when you talk about having a stronger voice, we've got to build that voice too. And we've got to build, you know, the bodies that will be, train those bodies, support those bodies that will be in the right rooms, having important conversations, because this is not just a this year issue or this election issue. Um, I would say that this will be an issue for both of our lifetimes. We have to recognize that when we talk about North Korea, and you know, some folks have argued, well, maybe it's a chance to, to engage and whatnot. Let's look at their history. Let's look at their track record. This is the country, especially a regime that we know cannot be trusted at the end of the day. Let's pull our actual allies, friend, friends close to us to make sure that our adversaries know that an offense against one is offense against all, and we are prepared collectively to defend in this particular discussion we're having the Indo-Pacific and our people, our families. Thank you, Representative. Now, I, those are all my questions for you in regards to as my experience with Korea and your experience with the Korean journalist, mm -hmm. but I also wanna give you the opportunity to talk about anything that you are working on in this moment or give us any updates. We've We've covered a few topics the last few times you've been on the show with us. Yes, yeah. There are so many things that we got to get done. <laughs> We're in recess now, so uh, it, it's you, there's anxiety for me about all the work that we left on the table before we, you know, came home and the work we're gonna have to do in November. I will tell you though, the one thing that I left Congress on was yelling to anyone that will listen to me, sending letters to leadership that we must pass disaster aid. It's not enough to give FEMA, but thank you, yes. And the CR FEMA got to draw down immediately the $20 billion, that is significant. We were already on the heels, just, you know, Helene was about to hit before we went out. And we know Milton was catastrophic, all of these different things. Um, but that money, that $20 billion, it's going quickly. It's going quickly. Um, and at that point, we were asking for all the disaster aids possible. And so we know now, and we've, you know, we've heard SBA is out of money. Disaster yes. money is gone at this particular point. You know, CDBG disaster relief fund is so critically important um, because that is actually for the help to rebuild permanently in communities struck by disasters. We're talking about Maui here. Right. And so it is so critically important that when we go back, the very first thing on the order of the day must be to pass disaster funding. It's gonna help Hawaii, it's gonna help so many other states and communities that have been have struck by disaster recently, but also those still recovering like Lahaina. And so for me, there's a lot of things I want done, but from the highest, highest priority thing now, we have got to fund that disaster relief. We have been asking Many of us have been asking for months and months now, please, we can bicker over little things, but this is real life for people, right? This is life-saving. This is preventing the disaster after the disaster. If there is no money for SBA, for FEMA, for HUD to be able to start investing in the recovery and the infrastructure and the housing, that is the disaster after the disaster. And we will be at fault for that. We can't control, contrary to popular belief, we can't control the weather, but we must control the response and the recovery. And that is a big to do that we have got to go back and we've got to pass. You know, A little second to that would be disaster tax relief. The house has passed it multiple times. I've been one of the, the, the lead you know, co-sponsors on that particular package of legislation, because again, we wanna keep more money in survivors pockets to help rebuild. We need that to pass. We need the Senate to take it up. We need to pass as part of any major legislation coming up by the end of the year. It has to happen for our people to help them recover. And so for me right now, big long list of things that I want done, um, but I would say the first order of the day is disaster relief. Well, thank you once again, I appreciate it. Thank you.